Jojo, welcome everybody to the Auckland Art Gallery Foundation Cocktail Chats. And we want to say thank you for joining us again this afternoon and thank you for um, your regular attendance at these wonderful chats, but also welcome to people who may be joining us for the first time. Um, it's fantastic to have you here uh, for your support for the Auckland Art Gallery Foundation and for the artists and interesting people that Mary and I have had the pleasure of interviewing over the last few weeks. Haven't the times changed? <laughs> so our session today actually is going to take multiple forms, but it begins as a book launch. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you artist Fiona Connor, who uh, is based in Tamaki Makoro and also in Los Angeles. Uh, welcome Fiona. Thanks so. <laughs> and also graphic designers Warren Olds and Felix Henry Tapley. Welcome to you, Warren and Felix. Hi, thank you. Joining us from your design studio <coughs> in Ponsonby. Lovely to see you all there together. Um, so now I'm sure Fiona is a familiar face to most of the people here joining us tonight, but just in case, I'm going to give a very short intro to you, Fiona. Uh, a graduate of Elam and CalArts in LA. Uh, and for the regulars uh, who, are, who visit the Auckland Art Gallery, you will know, of course, Fiona's work from the Walters Prize in 2010. Uh, also in exhibitions at public galleries in Christchurch, Wellington, Melbourne, Dunedin, LA, Italy, New York, and many other places as well. And she also has work in the collection of the Auckland Art Gallery and in the Chartwell Collection. In fact, the patrons group gifted a really wonderful major installation of Fiona's work quite recently to the Auckland Art Gallery. And, and I also realised, Fiona, that your artist, a living artist archive was held in the E.H. McCormick Library at the Auckland Art Gallery. Um, and memorable, I think, uh, your drawings, which were exhibited once the gallery was redeveloped and reopened. Your, you were one of the few, maybe the only artist who was given access to the demolition site when the Auckland Art Gallery was in state of demolition. And I also remember a, a really memorable installation of your work in Natasha Conlon's exhibition called Inside, Outside, Upside Down in 2015 where your work was installed in the gallery and in Albert Park. So Warren and Felix, together your design studio found via. You've got a lot of experience in art publishing. Warren, with your history with Clouds Publishing, of course. And Felix, great that um, you're a founding member of uh, Neo Gracie. Some of you might be familiar with Felix if you uh, attend up at Samoa House Library, where Neo Gracie is an artist-led space within the Samoa House Library location. So it's wonderful to have you all here tonight. And of course, um, Warren, Fiona and Felix have started a collective almost exactly a year ago, uh, which is going to be involved in distributing art publications um, and something that for, in terms of art publishing is a really important aspect of, of what, um, what you're doing. So we're here to celebrate and launch the book that is about um, that Fiona and Warren and Felix have worked on with a wonderful team of people planning to launch it in Auckland and LA, uh, but was impacted by the COVID-19 lockdown. So we're here tonight to book, launch this book. And I have to say that if you have one book on your bookshelf, this is the book you need to have. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I've been waiting for that moment for ages. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Here's the book. And so I'd like to pass it over to Fiona, Warren and Felix to introduce us to the book. Perhaps Fiona with the wonderful title of yeah. this cover page, but in fact, there's two cover pages. Over to you three to tell us about uh, that. Thanks. So, um, and also thanks for, for everyone that's here tonight. Um, some people were literally instrumental in making making this able to happen. Like, so it's really cool. Thank you deeply for your patience. Um, yeah, making books is, I've learned quite a long process and a very collaborative one. And um, yeah, so it's cool. Cool to come together tonight to celebrate that. Yeah, I think Fiona, I remember that, you know, it's the, one of the hardest parts getting a publication off the ground, isn't it, is, 
is getting all the help, but you've, you've, you've gathered together a wonderful group of supporters. Sarah Hopkinson, of course, has been instrumental in, in getting the, the book uh, together, and also the essayists, your, yeah. um, your gallerist in LA, 1301 PE. Yeah. And of course, a wonderful group of private um, donors who exactly. are supportive yeah. of your work. So it has to be mentioned that yeah, I'm very grateful for the um, support and trust of people. And also Scrap Wall was really helpful in the end. He kind of um, gave us the last push that was considerable. But um, we thought, Sue, that we'd just start with, we'd share our screen and just give people a look through of the book um, yeah. to kind of get yeah. people a sense of it. So uh, we're just going to play a video that our friend Tina made at the ALAC Book Fair in February. Great. I think what that really does, Fiona, is set the context for the book as an object in its own right. Um, you know, I think that just as artworks are a record of a thing in the world, um, you know, so the book as a thing in the world is a record of the artworks. So there's a really nice flipping between the role of the book and the role of the artwork. And I think flipping is a nice word to use when we think about the physical aspect of what you showed us in the video there, flipping through the pages. Can you tell us a bit about your, your thought about the book as an object? Yeah, I'm, I, I actually want to pass that to Warren. Yeah. Um, I guess when you come to make a book, you, there's, there's a lot of different choices that you make and there's no one book that you sort of end up with. So you have control over what that's going to be. And at that point, yeah, you, it's, it's up to you to decide how you deal with that artwork how you deal with that archive of images and um, how you combine those things together. And it's not so much that you're making an artwork, you're making a book, but you're um, yeah, giving that a form, um, making some choices about what that is. And um, I guess what I'm saying is it's a subjective kind of process. You know, there's um, things that you end up leaving out. There's things that you end up including and yeah, when they're sort of in play, um, they do something kind of new, I think, um, as a book. And that's the bit to sort of focus on, um, is, mm. yeah, is to give it a life in a way of its own. Yeah, and like, it's not, it feels like making a book is, it presents as many problems as it does solutions. And so it's like playing with that problem and, um, and sort of lingering in the, in the space of questions, which I think this book definitely does. Because um, a lot of my work is about experiencing it in person, so making a book about it, it's, it, it instantly presents problems. Um, so yeah, it's like how do you take that approach and extend it to a book and the experience of looking at it? So enough kind of vagueness is maybe we could talk about the cover. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. And I mean, we're, we're using the vehicle of Zoom, so it, it kind of brings into that play, Fiona, your, your discussion around the tactile nature of sculpture and your artwork and the tactile nature of holding a book. So right. we're, we're sort of exploring it through, through Zoom, and I think that the images that you can show, Warren, about, the, about some of the pages will give us a bit of a feel, but it's kind of like looking at a picture of a really fantastic plate of food. You know, your mouth waters, but <laughs> you can't eat it. it. <laughs> yeah. But maybe 
like you, like you said last night, this is just an introduction. So hopefully everybody will have the chance to see it in person. But should we show yeah. a picture of them? Yeah, like, let's have a look. Yeah. Okay. Um, and should we talk about the story? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So like part of the process of making this book um, was Warren coming to Los Angeles. Um, so Warren came to LA and stayed with me and he also stayed in Chinatown and we, and we like went to the CalArts Library and the UCLA Library and the beach. And we had these couple days of just hanging out, talking about our favorite books, talking about ideas. And one of the ideas as we drove up the five south through Los Feliz was the cover. And we thought of this idea, which was to commission a portrait of the photographer Alex North for the cover. So this is a photo of Alex North, who's responsible for photographing a lot of my generation's artwork. So through his camera, his technology and his subjectivity, he's kind of narrated the artworks, chosen the angle, the lighting, the shot. We thought it'd be funny, not funny, maybe that's the wrong word, but like, we thought it'd be really awesome to uh, have a photograph of Alex on the cover of our book. So that's the concept of the title. And this image was actually commissioned. We asked Alex to think about somebody he wanted to photograph him, and his mother took this photograph of him. Um, and it's, it's interesting because it sort of turns the camera around to the photographer. But I think there's something quite basic is that it, it's a girl's name and a phone number, but then there's a photograph of a man. And especially in the art world at the moment, there's a lot of kind of essentializing going on, thinking about an artist as a set piece, like has an, a fixed identity, a fixed gender and a fixed program. So we're kind of like thinking about those things and all those different, um, ingredients that come into play when you're reading an artwork. Mm. I like that use of your word ingredients, Fiona, because in a way when I look at this, I, I see it in this, yeah, the, the idea of three parts of thinking about you as who is this person, Fiona Connor. There's your name there, and, and for us in Auckland, we know of your history here as an artist with a, you know, a community of artists, particularly through Gambia Castle and through through your, your years working particularly here in Auckland, but then the American phone number sets you in a different context again in a different community. And then the idea of Alex as being someone whose eyes, the photographer's eye, is documenting your community. It's a way of instantly um, expanding your identity through this three-part cover. Yeah, that's great. That's really cool. Um, and I think that there's something that also is part of Warren and I's discussions was that like making a book is um, involves a lot of people, conversations, decisions. So we wanted to reflect that in how we made the book. Yeah, and I think that it, you know the cover sort of opens up some of those aspects as well. Like um, perhaps the making of Fiona's work involves working with other people in the production of the work, but ultimately the photographer produces the work as well because they're the one that documents it. Um, and <clears throat> the other aspect as well is that the phone number that you see was a kind of a, a burner phone that I had when I was in Los Angeles. Before that. Oh, right. so, um, once again, it kind of plays with a lot of those kind of um, readings that, that somebody might come with to looking at this as a cover. Um, the idea that that is a photograph of the artist or the idea that that's even Fiona's phone number um, mm. are all up for grabs there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should we move on to the next ones or something? Mm. <laughs> this is sort of in the order of the book. So yeah, there's two covers. That was the second cover. This is the sort of title page um, with a work from Kandu Academy. I mean, an image from Kandu Academy, um, which was a show in... Hopkins and Mossman in Futiki Street, Auckland. <laughs> yeah. What year would that have been? Then? Oh. Sarah? 2018, is it? 
No, a bit earlier than that, I would say. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Warren, I think you, I think you made a, you, you, you used a really interesting term that we want to kind of delve into a little bit later on, but you, you used the, the reference to the image as being documenting the work. So this idea about documentation is really central and core to, to uh, Fiona's work. And in fact, if you flick to the next page, Warren, the, your next image, which is the, the table of contents. This is what the, one, the very first essay that Travis um, uh, writes about, where he first really introduces this idea of Fiona's work as a form of documentation on a one-to-one -one scale. So you've got the documentation of um, the photographer's uh, perspective on the work. There's the actual idea of the artwork itself being a documentation of something. And the book here is documenting all of those layers of documentation. So <laughs> it immediately introduces this idea of Fiona's work, which I think the book encapsulates really well as a concept, is this kind of interconnectedness of layers of webs of activity happening all through this kind of idea that's explored in the book about documentation. So there's the list of essays, and the essays um, are fantastic. Um, and explore different aspects of your work, Fiona. I think that, um, I, you know, the, you've drawn in people who've had close connections to you. Who, who are the people here? Who are the writers that are, are featured, Fiona? Um, so there's uh, Travis Deal is an, I, they're basically people in my community in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. then Kelly Bryant um, is part of our wider community uh, that she was in Auckland, uh, mm. in Auckland Uni, and then at Monash in Australia. Um, yeah, so they're, yeah, people that I use the book as a way to, like, enable a sort of a deeper conversation about my work. Um, mm. And then my dad did the, sort of the bios, which were, we were, we sort of authored specifically. Um, but there's, there's the content that you're talking about, but also this page is a kind of perhaps a good key to the um, to the graphic design decisions. Um, so there's this yeah there's like this yeah there's like a design program throughout, including the font. Um, so maybe I'll just quickly because I think this relates to. So, um, like the process of making this book involved this like kind of back and forth between Warren and I and mm. part of that was doing a talk at, uh, in Las Vegas so I got Warren to I worked with Warren to design my list of images for all the talks I did for a couple of years mm. and through that process of us working on these small design tasks we developed a language for the book uh, so okay. this font that we used is actually from the University of Nevada um, it's their corporate typeface that they use on all of their kind of branding. Um, so when, yeah, when we made the slide list for the, the, the lecture there, we just used the typeface they were familiar with um, mm -hmm. and sort of gave it back to them in a way. Um, but yeah, it became something that um, was interesting in itself, I think, um, on its own. Yeah, you know, away from that corporate branding, and it became suitable for the book. Um, yeah, a nice serif font that was readable and kind of vernacular. I think there's like an interest in the practice and like the idea of a vernacular design, which has become really slippery and complicated with like the way that design has become so digitized and people are designing their own things. There's less of like the, that, so that conversation has become perhaps more slippery, but um, but yeah. Uh, oh, certainly, um, when, if you talk about the, the design of pages like this as being a, a kind of an a, also an aid to navigation throughout the book, um, I, I certainly found getting to know the book and spending time with it, it's, it's one that I've, you know how when you hold a book, especially a book with quite, quite big size such as this, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of holding multiple places with various fingers in it while I'm consulting this, but also there's a reference to a page number. Right. And, and, I, and more than anything, I found myself flipping back and forth because I'm trying to 
mul see multiple references at one t at any one time about a particular work, for example. But I'm I'm kind of physically doing that to the book, and and the page numbers I noticed yeah. have become incredibly important. And so many books don't have page numbers, but these page numbers are active reference moments that you have to physically go back and forth to access. So this is kind of the start of, if you like, a kind of navigation journey through the book and the physicality yeah, of it. That's totally, I feel like, really good. I'm like, that's, a, that's such a good impression to take away from this project, is that like, it rewards different types of viewing. So you can like, just look at images or you can really delve into it in an indexical way and really trace the work through different pieces of writing, images, whatever. Mm. And I think we were interested in that kind of like, yeah, like that kind of reader that may bring different engagement to it. But should mm. we show you guys some more images to, to yeah, uh, to like, keep flicking, yep, okay. keep flicking as we we are. I'll tr I'll trace you in real time. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> yeah, Travis was really interested in like understandings of public, especially in the states. Mm. I actually, I thought his essay, I mean, I, I read it over, a, 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 you know, a week or so ago and then again yeah. yesterday, and my reading, my interpretation of his discussion about the, what is a monument, my God, it's changed in the last day or so, mm -hmm. uh, rereading his essay when he's discussing about this idea of a private monument, a public monument, and what, what is the role of a monument, um, it's, mm -hmm. it's, that's what I kind of love about books that are living, they change and your reading interpretation of them change, depending totally. on the context that you're reading them in. Yeah, I mean, Kimberly's text right now is just, it seems oh. so like prescient and Unbelievable. About, yeah. Like, Do you want to flick to that one next? Because that yeah. same thing happened with this. This is, Kimberly is talking about a project called Color Census that Fiona did in Los Angeles, where you've done, a, almost like an art, sort of an architectural but archaeological and sociological analysis of this particular kind of street of houses and looking at the history of it, but also a kind of demographic study of it, Fiona, isn't it? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Maybe if you've got yeah. an image on the next page. Sure, I'm not sure if we have an image there, but the project was involved um, the street behind um, 1301PE, the street behind Brian Butler's gallery, I knocked on people's doors and did like a, a survey of the colors that they painted their walls. Um, so we'll just pull up a, uh, should we try and find anything? Hmm. I'm not sure if we can. We might get to it later because it might be in the images at the back, towards the back of the book. Yeah, I no, think I we'll just find it real quick. Cause I think oh. we've, got, uh, we've got hot keys here. Right, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, know, I mean, I think that this is an experience I've had time and time again in the last week since we've been out and about and going to galleries and, and yeah. the world. Every single day I wake up and I turn on the radio and I kind of hold my breath for a second or two and think, oh my goodness, what are we going to hear about this morning? And um, that, that's been happening so much. Uh, I certainly found it when we were looking at the Civilization Photography Now exhibition, looking at some of the images at the gallery. Yeah. And how the interpretation of them have changed so extraordinarily. And this is what's happened with with this essay of Kimberley's in the book, for sure. And these projects actually, Fiona, that you've done and the methods of, that you've you've tackled, um, like knocking on people's doors. Yeah. That's a Fiona kind of thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's definitely um Yeah. I mean I think you know, there's so many, like the, the, the meaning of a work, if you want to say it like that, is never fixed. And that's both its uh, beauty, but it's also its volatility. Um, and um, it's kind of interesting to, yeah, to kind of like experience that. But these, the conversation, like in Los Angeles, Black Lives Matter and race has been an issue since I've lived there. It's a mm -hmm. lot, you know, like this isn't a new conversation. So I think that's why Kimberly's text is so like pertinent is because it was a, um, it's a hotbed, you know? Um, and so I think that the Color Census project was kind of thinking about 
like how to bring complexity to the issue of like understanding color and interpretation and like um yeah the, this is a very particular street it was actually the history of it was that it was a neighborhood where um african americans couldn't buy they couldn't rent um and uh it was actually uh one of the houses was designed by um uh, an African American architect called Quincy Jones. So there is like race kind of like really from the beginning, this is, it's been kind of around that. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's quite a, I think Kimberly's like text really, um, kind of takes us in there and thinks about, um, attributing like, yeah, the way that we think about real estate and how we like attribute value and culture to it. But um, I was personally really driven with that work to think about like, like the public face of a building versus the internal space of it. So like the, mm. public, the public face was black and white and the internal colors were like the colors of the walls, um, but yeah. But in a way, Fiona, it's, it's also another example of you asking us to pay attention in a very layered and complex way. And, and I think all of your work, um, that's what's remarkable about it, is that it operates on, on so many different levels. Um, there's the immediacy of the materiality and the labour of the associated with your making practice, but then slowly over time, you unpicking all the, all the layers of it by paying attention and thinking about it and making the interpretations that we might make with regards to context and meaning, means that all, that's what gives the projects timeliness, even if they were you know, done a few, several years ago, there's a kind of continuity. They grow, they build more, don't they, over time? A little bit like your, yeah. um, palimpsests of the paintwork that you work with, for example. Yeah, that's, re that's really kind of you to say, Sue. Um, and I think that's um, something that you get to appreciate when you make a book, is that you have all these different projects kind of come into one document, and then mm. making a book is just that again, you know? So mm. it's this kind of meta project, which is kind of cool. But um, I think this might be like another, should we share the screen? Yes, do, yeah. Okay, so um, we kind of talked about like the role of photography in, in like the way we remember installation. And this is something that's been, I got really interested in around, there was an exhibition at MOCA about land art and the, the catalog was dominated around the way that land art was remembered through photography and storytelling and I thought that was such a kind of a profound realization that like the most epic work that's so much about physicality became ended up relying on the most ephemeral um unfixed things um anyway so this spread is like one artwork documented by four different photographers um, and it's, yeah, it's like, it's this thing <laughs> where there are similarities and differences. <laughs> um, but, and then, yeah, I think like maybe, should we look, should we just keep on moving for a moment? Yeah, do. We'll, start, we'll create some turbulence. <laughs> okay. We're all into it. Yeah, we're in the flow. <laughs> yeah. Together with the, um, like this is the sort of main uh, image section that's within the book. And that also came from Fiona and I working together on those lectures. Um, so the, 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 the mm -hmm. base structure of the images came from that slide talk. So in a way, you know, for me, it was kind of interesting, this idea that you could just begin with that as a format and, turn, and use that to develop, um, yeah, a series of images that might appear, appear in a book. I mean, we filled it out, we changed it, but that's where it sort of started. Totally. And the talk, the theme of the talk was like, not theme, but the, the idea of the talk was like, how do you represent 
a practice through the digital media of photography um, when it when it when the point of the work in the beginning is to evade that so using a whole range of different documents to try and give people indicators or clues to the experience of the work um yeah we made some conscious decisions as well like within the slide talk um the the um you know the audience was presented with images and fiona talking about it obviously but also a list of um, captions or details about the slides that they were looking at or had looked at. Um, and so um, I think for the book, we wanted to retain a little bit of that um, separation between the details or description of the work that might occur in a text-based way and then the visual representation of it. So um, we really, you know, within the, the image section in the book, it reproduces that slide list at the beginning of the image section. Um, yeah. Sort of as a way of introducing it, um, but also as a way of providing an, an appendix, if you like, to those images um, mm. and to give them their own life. Um, but also we did this other thing as well, where we connected those captions up with where those works were discussed within the essays. Um, yeah. And I tell you what, you often hear people who have written books or published books that the biggest thing, you know, when they've, they've secured their publisher and they've secured their distribution thing is who's going to write the index. It seems to be like everyone's obsessed in the academic world about who writes the index. But right. the index and uh, the index in this book is it plays such an active part. I don't think I've ever used an index in such, a, in such an active way because to start with, it's a playful sort of way that you've even designed and presented the index because you're you're actually referring to the documentation that the photo of the photographer of the artwork. So right. you know you're even flipping flipping the perspective and the kind of aesthetic of the image that we're looking at, making us again pay attention. We're not looking at the artwork; we're looking at a photograph that someone has taken of the artwork, and the credit in the index is to the photographer. Right. Um, and then there's lots of, I mean, yeah, the detail of the cross-referencing back to the small references within each of the essays even. Right. Um, it, it's working incredibly well. And I love this idea about just this page website. <laughs> you don't actually yeah. give the website, but, you know. That, like a, it's, that originally appeared as like a slide in the artist talk, but, but what, I mean, which is a perfect example of what you're saying is like, how do you take the digital and make it into, a, like, how do you take a, I don't know, like, how, how do these formats translate? And like, when they become so dumb, but kind of like, kind of interesting. But I was gonna say like, this pro, like a part of the mechanics of this project was it was originally commissioned um, by a gallery that's now changed form. So it became, at some point it was, dislodged from that original commissioner and the three of us kind of took it over and drove it mm. and that like actually allowed us to take potentially more risks than we may have been able to take in the beginning um which um i guess is quite a relevant topic right now like when can precarity serve an artwork um and like what do you end up holding on to and driving and what do you let go of Mm. Um, yeah, so I think that like, this is definitely, there's like a risk, this is kind of a risky book a little bit, like it's kind of a, a, a weird, a weird child. <laughs> but it's kind of, it's playful as well, because, um, you know, like I think about this page with the word website and, you know, we're so used to um, jolly, you know, links that we click and activated phrases within sentences and to take us through to a website, but here's a, the word website, which in a way you could say is being deactivated as a as a link or as a site to go to a website. Um, okay. And we've and I, I think about your Mount Gabriel Ruby and Ash works where you've got two kind of sets of, of identical objects, if you like, but the context of how we see how useful or how active or how practical or how engaged they are depend on the context that we see them. One's in the gallery and one one is outside and it's the outside. Yeah, works. That, that makes me get excited about like this idea that sculpture can be a great conduit to help us understand things 
And one of the things that like we're all thinking a lot about is the internet and how to, mm. like, how to think about the internet. Like, mm. is there a model that we can use to help us understand it, to help us navigate it? Yeah. And what role chance has as well, you know, like chance, depending on whether you encounter an object here at, at Connell's Bay, you can encounter that um, water fountain, you know, in the, in the remote location on Waiheke Island uh, in, in um, New Zealand. And yeah. then the role that it plays there, you know, it's a hot day, we're walking around Connell's Bay, um, right. you know, we, uh, we, we welcome and it's kind of like a beacon up on the hillside, one final little bit of incline to get to a drink of water under a lovely shady tree. And right. then to think about its kind of parallel existence in another kind of time and dislocated place, maybe in the kind of urban uh, context of a busy, um, you know, a busy kind of foyer or lobby or outdoor place within a big city like Los Angeles or New York. Um, it's that kind of dislocation that happens between the objects that happens within the book as well. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, this kind of arresting singularity where you're having this, like, the, the slipperiness is punctured with, like, an uncanny experience. Which I think is often based on some kind of memory, lingering memory that we might have about... Right. Yeah, yeah, like you're keying into, like, an authentic thing. But maybe, like, that's a really good point to look maybe we'll go to that maybe if it's okay we'll go to that she's talking about that last sure. orange fountain right. and then yeah. the, the perforated thing because i'm i yeah like i um yeah so like yeah there's that orange fountain at connell's bay yes um, which is like i'll just introduce people quickly to the concept of that work it's like it was originally in skate in Christchurch, but this fountain is now installed at Connell's Bay and it gets updated with new weathering based on its original in Venice every year or two. Oh, right. So I go to Venice and I like document the way the fountain has been aged through life and then I go back to Waiheke and update it. It's uh, it's mm. quite weird, like I... I it's like a live link. Yeah, it's like a live link. Okay. Yeah, like no, a live, I love that. live yeah. surveillance webcam that it's done through like... And then actually, John and Joe related a story to me, which is that they had a visit to the, to the farm that was related to this nightclub. What's the nightclub, John and Joe, there? Ministry of Sound. So somebody from Ministry of Sound visited. Yeah. And oh, they, yes. they oh. knew the fountain. And then they went back to it. And then they did graffiti on it, and then uh, I didn't know, and then I updated that on the fountain. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, in moments like that, because this kind of insanity of the global yeah. distancing that we're all feeling, it just collapses, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 it's super, super weird, the singularity, yeah, it's crazy. So the, yeah. the I guess the last kind of like thing we were excited about sharing or like clue with the book, Yes. Um, was that like the last page um, is we were kind of wanting to talk about like the process of making the book and how that fit into the content yeah we're just working through the thing imaging. okay um <laughs> oh yeah Penny's just sent through a chat to everyone to say that if you've got any comments or questions, send, send your, uh, use the chat function and send it through to Penny. And um, we, we get to the last page of the book. Yeah. Oh, and the second to last. Tell us about that, Fiona. Well, yeah, I'll let Warren take the mic. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. um, so this, uh, yeah, uh, another playful kind of aspect, perhaps, um, this time, thinking about the production of a book. There's a few mm. aspects about the production of the book that we were interested in uh, including or making visible um, mm. in the actual book. Um, so this, uh, yeah, next to the fountain at Connells Bay is what we, you, or as designers, we would encounter as paper samples. Um, and so in this, in a paper sample book, you find 
a sample of the paper with some details about its weight and its kind of brand name. Um, and then often it's perforated so you can tear it out and give it to the client. Um, and so we've just reproduced one of those um, sample pages using, of course, the paper which is in the book as the last page of the book. Yeah. And I mean, as a reader, you know, like I'm not, I'm not kind of got the industry knowledge of, that you're talking about, Warren, in terms of using pages in that context about what, how you might be choosing a, a paper sort for a client. But for, as a reader encountering that page, it just reminds me back that what we're talking about is a sculptural practice that ta where tactility is um, key. And this, because of the little perforated page, I just find myself running my hand over, over the little perforations. And it makes me, it makes a little sound on the nice, the paper feels lovely. Uh, yeah. It just reminds me of that, the importance of the tactile, of the senses with your work, Fiona. Totally. That's so, that's so um, what we're hoping. That's awesome. And um, there's some fantastic, just to finish up, see, there's some fantastic images of um, the amazing project that's called Close Down Clubs. And um, that's the one something that's that, that gallery. At Close Down Clubs, yes. Now in the collection with, um, you worked with the, with the patrons and with Natasha for the closed yeah. down clubs. Like for, uh, just a, a different set of that same series of club doors. And it's actually on show, this group has in, just been installed in Antwerp. If you look on Instagram, like hashtag my name, you'll see a bunch of shows, a bunch of photos of the show that's just been installed. And being mm. from Belgium, the install crew was like incredible. So it's almost worth just looking at their beautiful craftsmanship. Now, you'll need to tell us about how to buy the book and so that you can, in fact, put the book on your own shelf there at home. Yeah. Well, we'll how do we do that? Um, um, the, the collective project that we developed is called June 20th. Um, and so, yeah, that's what the website is, june20th.net. We're just trying to find it. Right. Mm. It's not, it's not true. June20th.net, and that's where you can order the book. Yeah, the book. Um, we decided just with the distribution that we were interested in, just using a website really to, uh, to sell um, and, and distribute things. Um, the uh, uh, bookstores can order it from there, individuals can order it from there. Um, and then, yeah, we just sort of worked out a discount kind of program based on quantity. Well, hopefully the Auckland Art Gallery store will sell it. Um, yeah. But you can definitely buy it from our website and uh, it's in the chat. Yeah, the website's been sent through to the chat. And Penny, did we have any anybody in the chats uh, who's, who's keen to um, make some comments or ask a question? There's the website there. We love Nobody's it. come up with any questions or said that they would like to, but you've still got a moment to if you would like, so let me know. Oh, fantastic. You can even get the burn phone. I love that, that description of your burn phone on the, uh, on the uh, limited edition that they, um, Fiona's also produced. Right. Uh, Mary, Mary, Mary yeah. would like to ask a question, so I'll just make sure she's unmuted. There we are, I'm unmuted. I wanted to ask Fiona, what next? Because you're about to go back to LA. And hmm. I, I sort of, I'm always fascinated by the materiality of your work, and yet there's always so much thought that goes behind it. What's your next project? Ah, uh, well... I'm kind of like, um, like, like three sort of things. One thing is, I I came to New Zealand one week off shipping two shows, so I'm just about when I get back, I'll be like landing in the studio of like ten new closed down club doors. So that's like waiting for me. But in the long term, thinking about COVID, I'm kind of thinking about like one exhibition, which is like sort of the biggest 
architectural site specific show I've ever undertaken, which is like a bit of a throwback. But like, I just like, after doing this book and going so deep into the archive, I'm just so hungry to do like an exhibition that's just fully about the experience of it. Oh. So I've been given the opportunity to think about a massive space in this country, which in, it's planning hopefully going to happen mid next year. So that's sort of this one big thing. And the other thing I'm working on is like a um, series of projects and homes. So I'm working with um, Ryan at Fine Arts in Sydney on like a subscription. Mm. The idea is that we'll be sending artworks to people every month for 10 months and like how, just asking if we can like get art in homes. And Fantastic. So I think one of those will be actually given to the Auckland Art Gallery Research Library. Because mm. I'm really always interested in not just making work for people that can afford it, but like yeah. really, I'm really invested in this idea of public and all mm. sorts of people being able to access the ideas. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I think COVID's really kind of radicalized me. It's like, just like big, crazy installation and then like correspondence mm. mail art. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Well, yeah. look, I just want to say uh, thank you so much to Warren, Felix and to you, Fiona, for spending your, your time with us this evening. Uh, it's been an absolute delight to explore the book and to explore all of your hard work to make the project, project happen. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to the post-COVID unleashing of your wonderful uh, practice, Fiona, and all the best to Warren and Felix.